Okay, in this lesson we're looking at indirect truth tables. Now, what is an indirect truth table? Quite a few lessons ago I mentioned it. An indirect truth table is a way of assessing an argument that has way too many variables to write out um, a truth table, right? Because remember, the formula for determining how many rows in a truth table is L, um, equal, the number of lines is equal to 2 with the exponent of the number of variables, which means it's exponential. Right, and if you've ever done geometry, exponential looks like this, right? Or, I'm sorry, algebra. Um, you know that an exponential graph looks like that. And actually, I've included a graph on your line statement, but any of you on YouTube watching, basically what it means is this, right? Is if you have 21, if you have a propositional argument that has 21 variables, you need over 2 million lines in order to check the validity. Now that's obviously far, far too many to do. That's insane, right? There's no way to do that, right? You really need a computer to calculate something like that. Well, fortunately, there's an easier way for determining an argument that has many, many more variables than um, the ordinary, um, than three or four, right? If you have 10 variables, there's a way of determining it that really only requires, uh, at the most, three or four lines, right? Uh, but usually we can do it all in one line. And it's called the indirect truth table method. And it really works by going backwards. Um, so I want to kind of just show it to you, but it really involves just two steps, right? First is making the assumption that it's invalid, and then testing to see whether or not it works, right? So you start with the conclusion and work your way backwards, right? So let me give you an example. All right, let me erase this, right? Let's say we have A, then B or C, all right? B, then D, A, therefore, not C, therefore D, right? Uh, so let's assume that this is our argument. I hope you can see it up there. It's kind of hard to see it here. Um, I'm going to switch pins here and use black instead, right? So what we need to do here is we want to make the assumption that's invalid. Remember, our definition for invalidity was that all the premises are true, but the conclusion is false. So we're just going to write that in. And I find the easiest way to write it in is write it in with the circle around it, right? under each of the main operators. Because remember, it's the main operators that matter. Right? So let's assume that this is true, because this is the main operator of this premise. Right? This is premise 1. Here's premise 2. I'm just going to kind of do this so you can keep track of it. Let's assume that that's true. Here's premise 3. And let's assume that's true. Right? And then here's our final premise. Which one of these is the main operator? Right? The conditional. Well, let's assume that's false. Oh no. <laughs> I'm sorry, just joking. All right, so can, now let's start with this and work it out. Can we actually make sense of this? If we can show a case in which all of these functions operate correctly, um, even though that the main operators are true and the clues is false, then it'll be invalid. If not, it's valid, right? Okay, so let's start with this. I always start, say, always, pretty much in logic, you always start with the conclusion when you're talking about anything. Start with the conclusion, understand what the conclusion is, and then work your way from there, right? So fortunately, since we're looking at conditional, the only way for a conditional to be false is if the, there's only one case which really helps us, because it means we can start with one line. Um, otherwise, we might need more, right? In this case, it means that if the antecedent is true, but the consequent is false, then it's false, right? So that would mean this is true, and this is, well, I'm sorry, mistake already, right? That would mean this is true, and this is false, which means that C is true, right? Let me move back so you can see that, right? This would be false because the antecedent would be under the negation, and then the D would be false, and then, our, and then we put the C as true. Now that we know what the C and D value is, we can plug them in, right? So the D is gonna be false, and C is going to be true. Um, I'm sorry, C is false. Hopefully you saw me make that mistake. Right? Uh, okay. Okay, so let's see. So that, and all the way we can look at A, that means A always has to be true as well. Because remember, they all have to be consistent. So we just need to really figure out what B has to be, the value of B. Now you can see right here, let's start with this premise, right? If D is false and it's a conditional, that means the B has to be false, right? It has to be false. Otherwise, it's going to be false, right, in order to keep this premise true. But so let's plug it in. Let's put our B here as false, right? 
now under a conjunction. I'm not, I'm not a conjunction, a disjunction. If you have two falses, right? It's either false or it's false. What do we say? That's actually false, right? So that's false, right? But then look, here we have, if A is true in our conjunction here, let's just circle it here. We're looking at these two lines, right? Utilizing this operator, right? But here we have true, false, can't be true, can it? Right, because if the A is true and, the, and the, um, the disjunction is false, then this premise is actually false. But we put it as true, right? Which means that this argument is actually valid, right? Because it shows that, and because it shows that there's, that our, our assumption actually doesn't work out. So the indirect truth method, the indirect truth method is the opposite, but in terms of looking for invalidity, right? You're assuming invalidity, and if it can work out logically, then it's actually going to be invalid.